exciting to see so many folks on here to talk a little bit about posters. And um, I know that most of you are engaged in undergraduate research projects this summer and hopefully will present at Discovery Day um, or other opportunities. And so I'm excited to be here and talk with you all today. If you have any questions at any point, feel free to drop them in the chat. We can also be pretty informal here. And so if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and, and jump right in. Share my screen here. So as Sandra mentioned, um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about how to set up a poster, and I'll go through this relatively quickly. Again, if I'm going too fast, stop me, ask questions. Um, but then what I, I find most useful, and I think most people who've been to these sessions I've done before would agree, what's most useful is to look at some examples and see how people have created uh, posters before as a way to kind of take some time to think about, okay, well, what, what might I want to do and how might I want to set up my research poster? So The first thing I'll talk about is really just the basics of how do you even create a poster? Uh, show of hands or emojis, how many of you will be creating a research poster for the first time? So I'm curious if you are, put in either like an emoji or a hand raise or I'm just curious. Okay. All right. A good number of people. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So a lot of folks. Um, well, good. So if you're here and you're thinking, I don't even know what it means to create a poster, we're going to start with that. Uh, so the majority of people will create posters in Microsoft PowerPoint. If you are familiar with Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign, you can probably do it via Canva as well. Those are some other programs folks will use, and particularly people in um, architecture, art, architecture and design, um, those might be platforms that your uh, mentors want you to use. I will admit, I am not as familiar with those. And so I'm mostly going to focus on PowerPoint. And unless you're in a discipline that emphasizes the importance of using something other than PowerPoint, I would highly recommend that you use PowerPoint. It's the easiest. It's the most Straightforward, mostly because most people are relatively familiar with how to manipulate slides on PowerPoint. And so it's a little bit easier uh, for most folks to use Microsoft PowerPoint rather than working with one of these other um, programs. And so when you're building your poster on PowerPoint, essentially what you're doing, instead of setting up a presentation where you're, where you're using multiple slides, you're going to create one single slide and make sure that it's sized correctly so that it fits the poster standards for wherever you're presenting. So at UT, generally the poster size is 36 by 42 or 42 by 36, whether you set it up horizontally or vertically. Um, and I'll tell you that one of the reasons for that is that's the, the size that our um, UCopy can print um, and our poster printers can print. Different, uh, Conferences and events might have slightly different poster sizes, so that's something you always want to look into. But when you're in a PowerPoint, what you want to do is set up a single slide so it's set up um, for that particular slide. You don't want to design it in the default PowerPoint slide because that's set up to print on essentially an eight and a half by 11. Um, and if you think about it, if you put pictures or graphics and even text into something that's supposed to print on a single sheet of paper, and then you blow it up into a poster, not going to look good. Um, your pictures and graphs in particular, everything's going to get distorted and kind of pixelated. So you want to make sure that the slide itself is set up so that it is a 36 by 42. Um, if even doing some of that feels overwhelming, what I always recommend, even if it doesn't, quite frankly, is to use the official UT, use the official UT template um, for your conference. This is particularly important if you're going to an external conference and you're representing UT, you want to make sure you are on brand. But even for internal conferences like Eureka um, and Discovery Day, I think it's a good idea to use 
the UT templates. You can find the UT templates on the Eureka website. Um, and I'll, I'll send these um, slides um, for distribution afterwards so that you'll have the link. But when you go to this link, you can download, and you have a couple of options. You have vertical and horizontal. I, I prefer horizontal posters and most people set their posters up horizontally but um, there are options. So when you go to this link, you can download um, poster templates. Now you're gonna get three slides. This doesn't mean that you build your poster on three slides. It means that you have the option to choose between a two column poster, a three column poster, which is probably the most common, um, or a four column poster. So you wouldn't use all three slides, you would choose one to use. But one of the things you'll, you'll see is that the slide is already set up in the correct size. So if you go to, let's see. I'm not sure if I can get to the slide size right now, but the slide size is set up correctly. So you'll see it actually down here in the bottom corner, you, you're looking at it really far zoomed out at about a 25% um, view. If you zoom into 100%, so this is the actual size it will be when it's printed out, you can see that things are much bigger. Um, this is actually a useful activity to do sometimes to see how if you want to see like, oh, I want to know how big that picture is actually going to be once it's printed out. You can zoom back in to 100%, but you can see here, you know, that's how big your title is actually going to be once it gets printed out. You tend to work with it at about 25% so that you can see the whole thing at the same time. Um, but again, if you use these templates, everything's already set up for you. It's also fully on brand, um, which is particularly important when you're representing the university outside of um, outside of internal conferences. Okay, and I'm just checking the chat, make sure there aren't any questions so far. Again, if you have questions, feel free to jump in and say, hey, Virginia, can you stop and, and say that again? Or can you explain this a little better? Um, feel free to, to jump in. Okay, so once you have your poster all set up and you're ready to go, one of the things you want to think about is how you format your text, um, because this is really important because if people come by your poster and they can't read it or they can't figure out what's going on with your poster, they're going to move along. One of the things that makes posters different from a research paper is the visual aspect is just as important as the content. Um, so you, how you um, organize your content and how you represent your content in a visual way is just as important as the content itself because if people can't quite figure out what's going on visually, they're not going to stop to engage in, in the content. So you first want to make sure that your poster fonts are big enough for folks to read. So when you're looking at your title, it probably needs to be somewhere between 80 and 120 point font. So pretty big. So again, someone who's walking by can read it from a bit of a distance. Then your subheadings um, need to be somewhere between 48 and 68 and the actual text. Um, so the main, the bulk of the content should be somewhere between 32 and 42. Um, again, one of the nice things about using the templates is all those fonts are preset for you and you don't have to worry too much about it. But again, you wanna make sure, especially for your headings and your subheadings, that someone walking by can read them easily. One of the things I often recommend, because that's kind of hard to tell when you're looking at it at 25%, is do what I did earlier, blow it up to 100%, even though you're only gonna be able to see maybe you know a few letters or maybe a single word, and then go walk about five feet back from your computer um, and see whether or not you can read what's on your screen. Another thing that's really important in terms of text is to make sure to include your name, and group author names and affiliations. So we're, we're people, uh, what universities people are affiliated with. We'll see this a little bit later in the, um, in some of the examples. But one of the reasons this is really important is that often with poster sessions, you won't be standing next to your poster the entire time people could theoretically view it. So you wanna make sure that you and all of your group members are on, uh, or all the people that you worked with are on the poster so that 
Um, if you're not at your poster and someone's walking by and they say, oh, this is really interesting. Um, I, I want to know more about this. They know who you are and how to contact you. And that's a really great networking tool. It's a great um, thing to think about when you're considering graduate schools um, is that you want to make sure if people are impressed by your research, they know who you are. So always make sure that not only your name is on there, but also anyone who worked with you um, so that everybody gets credit. Um, and so that people who are looking at your poster when you're not there know that you're the one who did all this great research. Then when you're setting up the actual content, you want to try to use generic and easy to follow subheadings. In STEM fields, this is really easy. So you have maybe um, an introduction, a methods, um, a result, a conclusion, a discussion section, kind of following uh, typical scientific structure. But even in um, social sciences, where that, that sometimes that same structure is sometimes applicable, but uh, pre professional areas like business or social work in um, the humanities, making sure that your subheadings are really easy to follow. Because what's generally going to happen is someone's going to walk by your poster, they're going to say, Oh, that's an interesting title. So that's the first thing that they're going to look at. And then they're going to say, well, do I want to read the rest of this? And for um, for posters that follow that that kind of more um, scientific process, they might say, I'm really interested in what methods they used. And they need to be able to find that quickly. Or I'm really interested in what they um, found out about this topic. And they want to be able to find the results section fairly easily. But similarly with other disciplines as well, they want to know, you know, what's What's in this poster? What is this going to be talking about? Um, and how can I quickly find the different pieces of the, the puzzle um, so I can put it all together and decide whether or not then it's worth maybe stepping up a little bit closer and taking a look at the smaller text and or engaging with you if you're standing there to present. Um, and then the last thing is, is you're thinking about your title. Don't let your title be too lengthy. It's got to fit on that poster. <laughs> So you don't want it to be too lengthy because the longer it is, the smaller it's going to need to be in terms of font. You also want to think about who your audience is. So are you presenting this to a general audience? Like you might be um, at Discovery Day where there are going to be lots of people from lots of different disciplines um, who may not understand highly technical terms related to your subject. If you're an organic chemist and you're presenting at the World Organic Chemistry Conference, your title can probably be a little bit more technical because the folks there are more likely to be able to understand it easily. If you're presenting um, posters at the Hill or posters at the Capitol, we're going to be presenting to politicians who, again, they're going to be educated, but not necessarily educated in your particular field. How can you present a title that's going to draw them in and help them understand what your poster is about. So always think about um, who am I presenting this to? What level of knowledge do they have related to my subject? And how can I make this approachable regardless of background knowledge? Um, you can, of course, get more technical as you talk about the actual content um, because you have a little more room to explain that. But when you think about, you know, how do I capture folks' attention um, as they're walking by? You want to think about what you want to say with your title. All right, so far, nothing in the chat. I hope that means y'all are with me and we're doing really well and not that I've lost you at the very beginning and, and, and everybody's checked out. Hopefully this means everybody's rocking and rolling with us. Okay, so probably the hardest part of a poster, thank you, Faith, I appreciate the thumbs up. <laughs> um, probably the hardest part of creating a poster is keeping your text short. So um, the general rule of thumb, and again, this varies a little bit by discipline and a little bit depending on what your poster looks like and how many graphics you have and those kinds of things. But generally, you want your text to be no more than 900 words total. So if you're trying to figure out, okay, well, what does that look like? Um, if you wrote a typical 12-point font, double space, one-inch margin paper, 900 words would fit on about three pages. So most undergraduate students write 250 to 300 words a page. So you're looking at three, maybe three and a half pages. Most of the research that y'all are doing, I am sure could fit into a 20 to 30 page paper if you wrote up all of your research. And so it's 
really important when you are thinking about writing your poster, what is most important to telling my story and how do I do that in the most efficient way possible? And so a couple of ways to do that is instead of writing in paragraphs to use lists, um, to use bullet points, to use some highlighting, to use some um, smaller headings under your subheadings to, to break things out so that you can present your information in a visually appealing and what I like to call an easily digestible manner. So again, something that folks can find easily and read quickly and easily because people are not going to stand at your poster and read, you know, 10 pages worth of text off of a poster. Um, whereas if you use bullets and lists, you can cut out some of that unnecessary verbiage. Um, you know, you don't need transition words or um, transition sentences or things like that. Um, all that's got to go away and you've got to get right to the heart of what your research is. One of the things that helps with posters though is there's a visual element to it. Um, now you can of course always um, include graphs and images and papers as well, but um, in posters, your images need to do a lot of the talking. They've got to sort of stand in for a lot of the text. So you want to make sure that when you're creating graphs and images, that when you're when you're doing graphs, everything needs to have a label. So all, you know, different points, I need to know what those are, different um, bar graphs or pie, pieces of pie charts, whatever it may be. Um, as your viewer, I need to know what all of these different things mean so I can understand the, the picture together. And they need to be, graphs need to be easy to read. So not too cluttered, um, not, uh, you know, data shouldn't be squeezed in too tightly. Um, the graphs need to be easy to read. You want to be careful about using colored backgrounds on your graphs or grid lines or boxes that kind of, excuse me, clutter the space and make it more difficult to read. And then similar with images. So all graphs and images need to have a caption. So tell me what I'm looking at. Um, because you can tell me what I'm looking at and you can use a really good graph or an image. Again, that'll replace a ton of text um, and give your viewer a fuller understanding of what's going on in your research. Um, okay, so once we've thought about, you know, how do we set up the poster, how big should everything be, what should it look like, um, and how much text to put in there, then we have to think about organizing it and putting it all together. One of the things you want to think about is something called reader gravity. So when we were children, we were taught to open a book and read from left to right, top to bottom. And so that is how folks are going to read your poster. Um, they're going to start in the left-hand column, and they're going to read across that column and then down that column. And then they're going to come to the next column and read. And so if you have, um, you know, introduction and then methods next to the introduction, then results, and then you come down here and you do conclusion, uh, discussion, and then references, people are not going to follow that well. Uh, because that is not natural to our eye. We're going to start in one column, read all the way down before we go to the next column. And so you want to think about that um, and how to ensure that your poster is in a logical order. Most people use, as we saw in the example templates, a three or four column format with three or four rows. So with each within each column, you know, three or four sections, essentially. And as you're putting all of this together, you want to be careful about difficult to read colors or distracting color schemes. So you wouldn't want, um, you'll see in our poster templates, there's a gray background and white writing for the title. And that works well because it's really big. White writing works well um, when it's big and on a darker background. Um, white writing does not work well in smaller fonts. And it certainly doesn't work well on say like a light blue background. Um, say, you know, neon colors, <laughs> a little distracting. Um, and so you want to, and again, this is why I like the template because it's got nice UT branded colors. Um, they're easy to read, easy to follow, but you want to be really careful that as you're trying to design an interesting poster, you don't overdo it with your colors to the point that it takes away from the research. Um, it's also okay to have white space or depending on the background color of your poster, whatever that may be. Um, 
you want to have some balance. You don't want there to be so much information on your poster that it just feels what I, I always say that there are posters that I look at and I, I feel claustrophobic, right? It feels like everything is really squished together and there's not room for anything. And it feels like, you know, you've just had Thanksgiving dinner and your pants are really tight and everything's about to, you know, one more pumpkin pie um, bite um, before things kind of bust open. And we don't want that to happen. Um, so you want to work to achieve some balance with your poster and leave a little bit of white space, particularly in between columns and rows. And then the other thing is you want to try to highlight your takeaway message. So different folks are probably different stages of their research when they present posters. Some people are still in the, the met, are still developing their methods. I mean, we don't even have results yet. Um, some people may have done their entire project, but there's one piece that really stood out that they want to highlight. So think about how to do that. Some people will do things like having two smaller columns on the outside and a larger column in the middle where more important information goes. <clears throat> but there are different ways to think about how do, I, how do I draw my reader into the most significant finding from my research. And then finally, the, la the very last piece is to make sure to include your references and acknowledgments. References obviously are important um, so that we don't have plagiarism issues, but uh, also to show folks that you've done your research um, and you know what else is out there. And then it's also important to acknowledge anyone who's helped and supported you. This will become particularly important as you all go off to great careers in research and you get all kinds of funding and grants to do your research. Uh, when you do that, you want to make sure you acknowledge particularly anybody who's giving you money. Um, that's very, very important. Uh, but anyone who has supported or mentored you along the way, you want to make sure you include um, references and acknowledgments. One of the nice things I will say about those, those don't really need to be readable from a distance. Um, if someone's really interested in your poster and wants to know your references, they're going to come up and look at your poster. And so you'll see, let me go back to our template. So in the template, you'll see down here, this place to add text. This is a great place to add references. Um, or acknowledgements. If you can fit your references in the text up here, you could always put acknowledgements down here. You could theoretically try to put both down here. It might be a little crowded if you did that. Um, but this can be in a, a, a bit smaller font than what you've got up here in your main area, just because again, people don't need to read it from quite so far away. Now you don't want it to be tiny. I think this, yeah, the poster has it set here at 36 point font. So, um, so that's something just always keep in mind you want to make sure you have those two things on, on your poster. Okay, before we go to our sample slides, the last thing that I, I like to say about posters is make sure that your poster tells its story all on its own. Um, so again, you will have a presentation to go along with your poster, which is great because that can really help flesh out your research and highlight more of the nuance in, in the research that you did. But if you're not standing next to your poster, you want to make sure that anyone who comes by and is interested in your poster can get the full story of your research or get a full story of your research um, from the poster itself. Again, there might not be as much nuance there might not be as much detail, but it needs to be a complete story, you know, kind of beginning to end um, from, from your poster. Because again, you, you want it to be able to stand on its own for those who come by and look at it when you're not there with it. It also makes your presentation much easier if your poster does the hard work for you so that you can kind of fill in the gaps and tell the fun parts of your, your story and your research. Yes, Timothy, perfect segue. What we're gonna do now is look at some posters. So I've given you a ton of information and I haven't shown you anything. So now we're gonna put this into practice. So I've got a few posters that I want us to look at um, and talk about, and I will admit they, they, they get better as they go along, but um, sometimes I think examples of, of what not to do are, are a good place to start. So we're gonna, any questions about what I've said so far before we pivot to some sample posters? Okay. 
Okay. All right. Let's move on to some sample posters. So the, this part does require a little bit of interaction from you guys. Um, so uh, feel free to unmute yourself or pop your thoughts into the chat. I've got the chat box open so I can follow along. So I want you to take a look at this poster. We always like to start with positives. I think that's important. Tell me what you think this poster does well. Yeah, Andy. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think, uh, you know, right off the bat, it does do a good job at um, organizing its section so you can clearly see the abstract introduction, results, conclusion, et cetera. Um, so it's just, you know, it's a good way to look at different regions of the poster pretty well, I think. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got um, clear and I think. Um, a couple other people said that um, it's it, you can find the different sections fairly clearly and they're easy to follow. Okay, and it's um, the the color is is easy to read black text on a white background. Um, you don't have any sort of overly uh, colorful or obnoxious kind of color schemes going on. A good point, Timothy. Vape, I'm going to get to your question um, about fonts. Okay, let's talk about what. So all, yeah, all everything's labeled. So if you're looking at the different graphs, things are labeled, um, so you know what you're looking at. Okay, tell me what you think needs to be improved about this poster. Probably exceeds 900 words. Yes, I would say so. Uh, <laughs> Too much use of graphs, too much text. Okay. Yeah. So we've not only got a lot of text, but the, it's all paragraph. It's all paragraph form. Um, when I look at this, it to me, it looks like somebody took a paper and just kind of copy and pasted it on there. Um, yeah, Gary. And as a result, um, some of these graphs and images might be too small. And yeah, Emma, there's no sort of list, there's no list or bullets, which makes it really difficult for me as a viewer to figure out, like, what am I supposed to be looking at? Like, what, what do these um, presenters really want me to key in on here? Uh, what is, what's sort of the most important part? Any other thoughts about this poster? One other thing I would say about this poster is it does have clear columns. I, I feel like the text is pretty close to the edge of each column. Um, there is some white space um, with, you know, with the, around the graphs and some of the images but the columns feel fairly close together to, for me. Um, and then I wanna go back, Emma asked, or no, not Emma, Faith. Faith asked a great question about fonts. I mean, I, you know, I don't, so when you're doing a, if you're using the UT PowerPoint, you wanna use the fonts that they have because the fonts are also on brand with, with UT. If you're creating your own poster, you know, poor Comic Sans get such a bad rap, but you know, I wouldn't do anything like Comic Sans or a script font. There used to be advice that for your headings and subheadings, you can use either a serif or a sans serif font, but for your text, you should use a serif font because serif fonts are easier to read. When I use those words serif and sans serif, do you all know what that means? Is it the little spiky pointy edges on like Times New Roman and things like that? Yes, thank you, Hannah. So if you all remember like early in high school, maybe even in middle school for you all and your teachers told you you had to write in Times New Roman, you couldn't write in anything else. Um, that was where the, the thought used to be that it was easier to read serif fonts and serif fonts have the little 
lines on the ends of different pieces of the letter. What I used to tell my students when I needed them to write in um, a serif font, and as I said, good UT students will write in serif fonts because the power T is a serif T. So if you think about our T, it's not just a straight line with the line across. It has the little, you know, lines that go down at the bottom of the crossbar and the bottom of the, the vertical line. And that's what a serif font is. And theoretically, that is easier to read because the letters are all differentiated. Um, and so uh, typewriters were all serif fonts. Sans serif have become more popular. So Arial, Calibri, um, those are two examples of sans serif fonts. They don't have the little lines on them. I, I don't know how much people follow that advice anymore that you can't use a sans serif font for your regular text. But if you want to just be extra careful about the font that you're using, I would recommend that when you're doing your smaller text, that you use a serif font. I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure what the main text um, on the UT uh, template is, if it's a serif or sans serif. Again, if you're using the template, use whatever font they have because it's on brand. If you're doing your own, that might be one piece of advice I would give related to fonts. But again, I'm, I'm old and old school at the same time. <laughs> and I don't know how many people still follow uh, that, that prescription, but that's, but it's a good question. Okay. So let's look at another poster. So again, this one, um, color scheme, fine. Um, the different sections are, are differentiated pretty well. One thing I will say that I don't love about the sections is that the results start in the first column, take up the entire second column, and then go into the third column. And so the second column is just kind of like a bunch of information, and it's not, you have these teeny tiny bolded areas. They're not really subheadings. Um, and so I, I would maybe think about a way to cut down on your text and just put the results maybe in the middle column. If really you have too much results, then I would use some kind of larger headings to differentiate the different pieces of the results so that this middle column isn't sort of a, a blur of, of text. Okay, so let's look at our next one. And I will admit on this one, the um, font is hard to read. It's, it's not the fault of the poster. It's because of the way it's been blown up and shrunk down and things like that. So we're just gonna think about it kind of generally aesthetically. What do we like about this poster? Okay, it's aesthetically pleasing. So it's prettier, right? We've got this nice background. Um, you've got things in boxes. So you've got some defined um, defined sections. You've got more lists. So it's fewer paragraphs, a little bit more listing. So it's easier to find the important information in that way. Okay, yeah, the visuals help enhance the research. And I think that's so important. Um, don't put visuals on just to have visuals. You want to make sure that the visuals are there to support your, your research. Anything else we like about this poster? Okay, let's talk about what we might want to improve about this poster. Okay, there are no results. Okay. And that may be a that may be lack of labeling and it may be um sort of a difference in the type of research that's being done. Um, so kind of making that more clear might be helpful. Yeah, so we've got some images, um, particularly down here next to methods. And then over here next to my experience, there could use maybe some um, better labels. Okay, yeah, Emma, this is a great point. So people tend to really like this background. It's nice and pretty. 
but this lighter blue with white font over top might be difficult to read. And so one of the things that could help with this poster, um, I think in a lot of ways would be to create, uh, a lot of people like to use like fun backgrounds and that's great, but if you can create opaque columns and put all of your text in there, um, that makes it easier to read and easier to follow. So you don't have these headings um, kind of floating out and about, but also so that the headings are easier to read and the background's still pretty, but it's not distracting. And I think another thing that would help in terms of creating um, nice opaque columns is this poster's not lined up very well. They're, they're sort of three columns, but they're not clear. Um, you know, everything, you know, boxes are over here and then over here and then in the center and then kind of down underneath the center. It makes it for me very difficult to follow. I'm not really sure what I should look at first. I'm not sure how to follow the story. Um, and I think too, that goes back, Gary, to your point that there are no results. We might be able to find the results more easily if everything went in sort of a nice, um, clear order. So I like to think of this poster as sort of the opposite of the, the, the last poster. This poster has a much, um, does a much better job of having contained text. Um, it's got good visual images. It's got a good balance of text and images but it's not really clear. There aren't really nice, clear, organized columns to, that make it easy to follow. Again, the reader gravity issue is, has not been addressed here. Any other thoughts about this one before we move on to the next one? Okay, let's look at this one. All right, tell me what you like about this poster. Okay, it's easy to read. Well organized, good use of space. Yeah, we've got three clear, distinct columns. Yeah, so we've got instead of using paragraphs, um, we've got lists. And that isn't to say that there are no full sentences on here, right? I mean, there are a few um, places here, like in the first call in the in the first section, and then down under methodology, there are a couple of sentences, but then a, a lot of the text um, is bulleted out. It's colorful, so it's got color on it. So it's visually appealing, but it's not, the, the colors are kind of nice and muted, which is good. Anything else that we like? Okay, what do you think could be improved about this poster? Uh, that is a good point, Emma. I will say the, the there were names but they got blacked out. But you were right to notice that. Uh, we want to make sure that there are names at the top um, for this poster. So a lot of these I, I've pulled off of sample poster sites and some of them black out names and some of them don't. Um, and this has blacked out names. So there were names, but it is good to notice that, that um, you want to make sure you have those in yours. Um, so the black text on a, the blue background. So maybe, Gary, I think that's a good point. Maybe if the... Um, background was closer to this sort of light seafoam teal blue. It would be a little bit lighter and a little bit easier to read. Okay, Faith, yeah, maybe um, 
reducing the number of colors or making it clear what each of the colors, oh, it, you know, it, it has what each of the colors means, but maybe um, making them a gradient, that might be easier. Okay, maybe a, some kind of color up top could help the, the um, title a little bit. Yeah, these are all good points. So I think we can all tell that this is a much better poster. Um, the colors are not too overwhelming, then maybe we could think about reducing the number of colors. Um, it's easy to follow. Now, again, this is a social science poster, so it doesn't have the exact same um, columns that a more traditional STEM poster would have, but it's still easy to follow. The other thing that I like about it, it doesn't have a lot of pretty images, but it does do things like um, in this first column under the background and introduction, it uses a flow chart to help understand some of the ideas that it's using. Again, replacing text with images, um, which gives them more space to do more. One of the things that I don't love about this is there's really no space between the columns. This is one of those posters that I look at and I feel like, ooh, this, is, this feels a little squished. Um, and so maybe broadening what you call the gutters essentially in between the space in between the columns might make it feel a little less crowded. Okay. Then I want to look at one more poster. Um, and then that should leave us time for questions. Okay. Um, so tell me what you like about this poster. Okay. Yeah. So it's using mostly bullet points, not a ton of sentences. Um, the titles are easy to read. Now this is a humanities poster. So again, you're not going to have methods, results, conclusion. You're not going to see that in most humanities posters, but they've created titles that are easy to read and easy to have an idea of, okay, I know what this section is going to be about. So good spacing. Okay, clear sections with lists. What might you think needs to be improved about this poster? I think they either shouldn't have used a map in the background, or if they were going to go with that, make the boxes more less see through, less transparent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hannah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, I think the map is cool, right? It adds some visual interest. However, it makes it a little distracting in the boxes with the actual text. Um, Faith, I see you mentioned this in the chat too. And so, yeah, you can either take off the map, but if you really like the map, another option would be um, to, yeah, decrease the transparency of the boxes to zero to make them fully opaque so that it's not distracting around the text itself. Any other thoughts about this one? So I'll say one thing about this poster that bothers me a little bit, and I, I don't think that this is universal. I personally, instead of having the boxed sections, would create just three columns because of the fact that not all the boxes are even. So your columns are nice and even, and I think there's a good amount of white space, which is nice. Um, the bullet points are a little close to the edge of the box. I would scooch them over a little bit, but I personally... <laughs> would create three columns um, so that even though, for example, conclusions kind of comes in the middle of Cervantes um, and uh, Ruiz, it's, it wouldn't matter as much if they were all straight columns. That might be a personal preference. One of the things that I always tell students is, it's good to use what I'm telling you as guidelines. If your mentor, or your faculty member or whoever is grading your poster, if you're getting a grade on a poster, um, 
gives you advice that contrasts what I say, do what they tell you. <laughs> um, they may have a specific way they like posters or some disciplines have um, unique ways that they like to present posters. So always make sure you're getting feedback from someone either within your discipline, if you're going to a disciplinary conference or someone who has knowledge of the event you're going to. So someone who's done Eureka before, Discovery Day before. Um, and sometimes that will still be your faculty member as well. Um, but always make sure you're getting feedback on this because again, dip, every discipline's different. Um, people, individual people who, again, might be grading or evaluating your poster in some way. Sometimes you don't have any control over that. Sometimes it's external judges who you won't be able to meet and talk with beforehand. Um, but your faculty member might have insight into, hey, judges at this event don't like X, Y, or Z. Or, um, you know, some, some faculty will tell you even like 600 words on your poster is the most you should have. So always get advice from someone else as you're going through this, especially if this is your first time creating a poster so that you make sure that whatever event you're going to, whoever's evaluating your poster, you're, you're putting forth what they want and expect from a, from a poster. Most of the things I told you are going to be in sync with, with that, but, um, some faculty have different ideas about the ratio of images to text. Sometimes it's 50, 50, sometimes it's uh, 60, 40 or 40, 60. Um, so always talk to, uh, uh, your advisors about, um, about these kinds of things. What other questions do you all have? I'm hoping that, um, looking at some of these examples have been helpful in thinking about what, 